Hello, I'm Paul Richards with the latest from science. And there's been a lot of talk about the scientific modelling being used by governments to help guide their response to COVID-19. But how reliable are those models? The Kirby Institute's Rainer McIntyre is a professor of biosecurity and a key member of the expert panel advising government. Rainer, welcome. Hello. Let's start with the basics. Can you tell me what is a scientific model and what's it used for? So um, infectious diseases modelling is, um, infectious diseases actually are very, very suitable for mathematical modelling because um, people exist in mutually exclusive states of either being susceptible to an infection, like the majority of the Australian population is, or infected or recovered. Um, and sometimes, you know, if immunity wanes, you can go back to being susceptible again. So we can create a model, uh, a compartmental model where we, make estimates about the people in each of those compartments and then we model the rate of their transition through those compartments um, and we can then look at what the epidemic might look like without any intervention and with different kinds of interventions um, over time. So models have, I guess, various assumptions that are built in that you use to then try to forecast what could happen under different scenarios. Um, Are the models proving to be accurate? Uh, No, no. Models are only as good as the assumptions you make and the parameters that you use in them. And particularly early on, we saw a spate of models, some published in quite, you know, prestigious journals that weren't right in their predictions. And it was because um, the data that was being used was uh, the data that was available at the time, which was um, data reporting of cases. So you have to just look at every daily number of cases and then estimate certain parameters from that, like the reproductive number, the serial interval, etc., and um, if you use data reporting, that can be uh, misleading because reporting might happen in batches. It doesn't actually reflect the day of necessarily reflect the day of onset of the illness. So ideally, you need data that tells you the day that each person first got symptoms, and then you construct your you you um, calculate all your parameters from those data. Yeah, it's really interesting, the different elements, the more data that you have to put into those models, I suppose, the more accurate they can be or helpful they can be in in planning for the future. I know testing has remained somewhat limited in Australia. Could this throw off the models and, and have our testing rates been robust enough? Well, we've had high testing rates, so, um, uh, you know, we've been able to ramp up the testing capacity, but the testing criteria are still restrictive. So you can only get tested if you've got symptoms and you're in certain categories, whereas in some other countries, um, if you're in those same categories, like if you're a close contact of a case, you can also get tested if you don't have symptoms. And so, um, you know, but you can, with modelling, and we've done that with one of our COVID models, you can estimate the number of missed cases, the ones that haven't been diagnosed um, using some of the data that's come from places like Japan where they did do extensive testing like on the Diamond Princess and also on people that evacuated from Wuhan. Do you expect testing then to be increased in coming weeks? I know that there seems to be a big effort to to get more uh, t- tests more available in Australia. Yes, I think so. I mean, with any new infection, initially it's a little bit slow and then as more companies start making tests and more validation is done of those tests, um, the capacity increases. You know, last year in New South Wales alone, we did half a million tests for influenza. So we have, technically, we have the capacity to test a lot of people. Uh, It's just this particular disease, um, the testing, uh, you know, some of the tests, like uh, the blood test, serology, isn't commercially available yet. And there is a problem with also the sensitivity of the of the other test, the PCR-based test that we are using. So, yeah, that that goes to my next question, which was why testing kits are so hard to access. And you mentioned that there are new tests that will be available soon. Uh, do you have any idea of, of how soon and and what how they, those tests are different from each other? So there's two categories of tests. There's the standard tests, which one of them is um, you get a clinical specimen, either some sputum or a swab from the back of the nose or the back of the throat, and then you test it for fragments of the virus RNA, and that's the PCR test. Um, That can be low sensitivity if it's particularly the throat swabs. There's been lots of 
instances where the throat swab has been negative repeatedly in people who do have the disease, which is why in China they started using the CT scan, chest CT scan to diagnose because they realised that the throat swab wasn't sensitive. Then there's a blood test, which is looking at whether you've developed antibodies to the infection, to the virus, and that um, takes some days to become positive. You won't be positive on the first day of illness. It might be five to seven days later that you start developing antibodies. So, um, you know, that's useful later to understand um, the exposure of people, particularly if you want to look on a population level at how much infection has been transmitting around children, etc. Um, that's the kind of test that's really useful. Uh, and then you've got the rapid point of care tests, which are tests that we have for influenza, for example, where you can get an answer at the bedside anywhere between 15 minutes and one hour. Um, sometimes you've got to take it back to the lab, and, but you'll still get it within a couple of hours. Um, and there have been some rapid point of care develop, tests developed. The Australian government has purchased, I think, 1.5 million point of care tests, um, but the ones they've purchased use serology. So you need to have antibodies for that test to be positive, which means somebody who's early in the state, early stages of the illness may not be positive for that one. And you're saying serology, and for those who, who may not be familiar, that's a blood test then, isn't it? Yes. Okay. Now, from the models, is it possible to tell when infections could peak in Australia? Yes, it is. Um, if you've got a well-parameterised model and you um, have all the interventions in there reflecting what's happening in society today with the restrictions we've got, um, then you can estimate it if things stay as they are, if the restrictions are lifted or if more restrictions are put on. What are the models telling us at the moment? Is there, is, uh, is there a clear answer to that question yet of when infections will peak? You know, there haven't been that many papers published. Some some were suggesting April, some were suggesting May, and others were suggesting June. But it really depends on what happens from here on. If we, um, The more interventions you apply, the more delayed the peak becomes. The peak becomes delayed and much lower, and the total number of cases become lower. So... Um, you know, in terms of waiting for a vaccine, it's a good strategy to try and delay the peak as long as possible and keep it low. Oh, that's a really interesting uh, point you're making. So that the the heavier the restrictions, that peak could be reached much later, but the number of infections will be much lower. Yes. Okay. You've been very vocal about the need for Australia uh, to be locked down and, and to have heavy restrictions in place. Are you comfortable with the current level of social uh, and physical distancing? Look, I think any amount of social distancing will help. Anything you do that stops people having contact with each other will help because with this particular infection, you can't tell who's infected necessarily because people without any symptoms can uh, be infected and potentially be infectious. And also people who are going on, going on to develop symptoms, the highest level of infectiousness might be in the two days before they get symptoms or in the first day of symptoms, which might which might be very mild. So that's, that makes it really tricky to control the disease. And one of the only ways until we get a vaccine is to stop people having contact with each other. Um, the, the strategy that I've advocated is a short, sharp lockdown. I don't think we need to be locked down for six months. I think we could, be, we could do a short, sharp lockdown that lasted anywhere between four and six weeks, which would bring us down to a very, very low baseline of cases compared to what we'd otherwise be dealing with. And um, then it allows, if we expand testing at the same time, and that's a, real, that's a parallel strategy that has to be used with lifting restrictions, you must be able to identify every single new case. It's no good just, uh, you know, um, testing people who've got symptoms. You have to recognise and accept that there are asymptomatic people out there. If there's an outbreak in a family, for example, one person in a family is sick even, you need to test everyone in the family whether or not they've got symptoms. If you're in a nursing home and um, there's, uh, you know, an outbreak, you need to test everyone in that nursing home. There's just been a study published in the United States which showed that at that point that the health department went in to test in the nursing home when the outbreak was recognised, half of the people who were infected did not have symptoms. Some of them went on to develop symptoms, but half of them had no symptoms. And given it's that very early period that's the most infectious, it's really critical to test high-risk asymptomatic people. So that's the other part of the lifting restriction strategy. If you don't do that, you're going to get a straight-up bounce back to really high levels. 
So for the re lifting the rest restrictions to be successful, you must accompany it with expanded testing. What could that look like in practice? I mean, this is obviously hypothetical, but uh, are we talking about, uh, you know, office buildings and, and you know, um, wide scale randomised testing of the population? No, I don't think it has to be random random testing in the population. I think just this, the current uh, national guidelines with a category added that if you're in any of those categories that are listed there but you don't have symptoms, you can also be tested. Plus, you allow any doctor to exercise their clinical judgment and order a test. So if doctors are seeing people in general practice or in a hospital and they think, oh, you know, this could be COVID-19, they should be allowed to test. And I'm getting a lot of reports from GPs, from doctors in hospitals that they are seeing patients that they think could reasonably have the disease, but they can't get a test. So those two things is all you need to do to um, have the security to be able to release those um, lockdown restrictions. Yeah, well, it's fascinating. And, and the clearest answer I've, I've really heard on, on exactly what that next uh, step um, should be. Now, there remains a lot of anxiety over the availability of personal protective equipment for healthcare workers around the world. What's your read of the situation here in Australia? Does staff have enough supplies of things such as masks? Well, it's not what I'm hearing from people at the front line. Um, and, uh, you know, I've got people I don't know contacting me, but I've also got my own networks of clinicians um, that I know. And um, particularly, I think if you're working in emergency or intensive care, uh, you generally have access to PPE, but people working on other wards um, who in other areas of medicine um, are finding it hard to get PPE in some hospitals, and I'm hearing that in more than one state. Uh, we know that there's a shortage. We know that there was a shortage, um, you know, after the bushfires because we had to use some of the PPE in our national medical stockpile for the bushfire victims and for the smoke inhalation, and uh, that left us in a vulnerable position when this COVID pandemic hit. Um, uh, there's been more masks and respirators ordered. I believe they're coming sometime at the end of this month. Um, but uh, it does leave healthcare workers vulnerable, which is another reason why I support the short, sharp lockdown, because I think we have to protect our healthcare workers. We can't um, expect them to be there for us when we're sick and to be standing and being able to treat us and not have them fully protected. That's a top priority. And if there's a vulnerability in the PPE supply, we really have to do everything we can to make sure that we don't let it rip through the community and cause massive numbers of cases because what the other other consequence of that is that the health system could fall over and the healthcare workers will start getting infected as we're seeing in UK in um, the United States we've seen healthcare workers die of covid-19 we've seen hospitals in the US where people have had to wear garbage bags who've died of, of COVID-19, uh, we don't want, why, why would we put our healthcare workers in that situation? They are precious and we have an obligation to protect them. That's another reason to keep the cases right down and not to allow transmission to spread in the community. So what's your advice to any healthcare workers who feel as though they don't have adequate personal protective equipment? Well, I'm hearing there's a lot of uh, crackdown on these healthcare workers that they are being threatened with uh, loss of job if they speak out. They've been told to be silent. They're really fearful. Um, and I think we, you know, it's in everybody's interests for our country, for our society to work together to address the concerns of healthcare workers and make sure that they feel protected and, um, uh, you know, it, yeah, we, we need to look into that. And just finally, on the issue of proper protective uh, equipment, uh, a study that you published in 2015 looked specifically at cloth masks. What did you find? So this was a trial done in Vietnam in healthcare workers, doctors and nurses, and um, they were randomised to have either a surgical mask or medical mask, same thing, just different name, um, or a cloth mask, which is a locally manufactured um, two-layered cloth mask, cotton and cotton blend. Um, or they were in the control arm, which meant they just did whatever they normally do. And what we found was that um, the people in the cloth mask arm had a higher rate of infections than the surgical mask arm, but they also had a higher rate of infection than the, the standard practice arm. It did turn out that people in that control arm 
Some of them were using surgical masks. A few were using cloth masks. So maybe that kind of um, blunted the effect a bit. But we did do a secondary analysis of just the people who wore cloth masks versus the people who actually wore the surgical masks. And that that difference still persisted. The people in the cloth mask um, still looked a lot worse. Uh, we also um, then looked at the cleaning, uh, you know, how often they wash their masks. And over 90% of people said they were washing their masks daily. I don't know if that was true or if they weren't washing it properly. That's another reason why it may have looked so bad because a cloth mask get, um, absorbs moisture much more than a surgical mask, which is designed to be water resistant. So um, something that's soggy and warm on your face is obviously going to breed bacteria and viruses and um, if you don't wash it every day or even change it twice a day perhaps it may increase your risk of infection. Now Rana just finally we're all being urged to stay home this long weekend at Easter I've received a text message message on my phone the messages are everywhere stay home but from your expert point of view why is that so important? Because we've had some really good gains from disease control, mainly from the travel ban. So the, the flattening of the curve we're seeing now is a result of the travel bans rolled out between the 5th and the 10th of March. You generally see the impact of any intervention um, between two and four weeks. It's related to the incubation period. So what we're seeing now is clearly the impact of the travel bans. We will see the impact of the social distancing in the next few weeks in, into the future. And we don't, we've had these gains and we've brought, we've flattened the curve. We don't want to go two steps backward because everyone, you know, moved around and went on holidays and had big parties and so on over the Easter weekend. Thank you very much for your time, Rana. No worries. It's a pleasure. We'll be back next week with more extended conversations with Australia's leading scientific minds. And if you're looking for specific COVID-19 content, we now have a range of articles and videos available on our website. Remember to stay home over Easter, and I'll see you next week. Mm -hmm.